All right. Hello. This time a little more quiet. Um, I wasn't sure. I didn't think uh, game clips would be quite right to start this stream. Um, yeah, so we're here. The emulator is running, which is uh, short of a near miracle because uh, apparently some of my hard disk images have disappeared and I don't know where I put them. So I had to kind of quickly recreate some stuff like make a copy of my Myst CD so I can mess with it if I want to. Um, but yeah. We're here, we have an emulator that looks halfway working. And uh, and by halfway working, I mean somehow it will only copy and paste plain text. So, you know, usually if you went here in Finder and clicked a file icon and uh, chose Get Info, you could click its icon and say Copy, and then it would show up here in the clipboard. But you see, there's some text that I copied earlier in there. Um, and then I could have selected this hard disk, done a get info, and pasted the icon in here. But of course, I can't paste text into that. So uh, this will be interesting. Um, because it means I will be trying to use regular and copy paste occasionally and it will fail. And I hope I won't screw up too much. But anyway, um, hello. Um, and what is our objective today? Well, our objective today is uh, to basically reproduce how one would have used HyperCard to create a game like Myst. Um, we won't make an exact recreation, for one, that would be a hell of a lot of work. And for the second thing, um, because um, Myst was started before HyperCard got certain features, and that in turn Oh, I'm peeking. Sorry. Um, you're having network issues. Oh, okay. Um, I think on my end, it looks okay. Yeah. Yes, I can read you. I can read you. Um, wait. Uh, I can just write that in text. But uh, hello, Ada. How's it going? Um, so yeah. Um, ouch outage on your side. That's no fun then. Well, um, I hope you can get it resorted or something. I don't really know what else I could do. Um, hear you but switched off video because it won't load. Okay, good. I guess I guess you'll him you ha you'll have to imagine how uh, <laughs> using HyperCard looked. So um, here's the thing. I mentioned that in other streams I did, uh, of which you can find recordings in my uh, on my YouTube, which should be linked underneath this Twitch thing, or if you're watching later, then um, you can't... Um, 
uh, if you're watching later, then you will already be on YouTube. Um, so that goes as well. Um, sorry, <laughs> slightly confused here. I shouldn't try to read and talk at the same time. Um, so yeah. Um, so I've mentioned before on other streams that HyperCard actually is a black and white only program. And so the first thing, if we want to create something like Mist, and um, I should probably mention, I am not going to recreate the graphics. I am horrible at 3D graphic applications and uh, you do not uh, want to see me try to create 3D graphics, so just assume that I had... Uh, so, so I will just be stealing the graphics for this tutorial from the actual Mist application. Um, so, uh, yeah, no need to uh, to worry about that. Uh, or to and also if you came here hoping I would give you graphics advice, I would just you know find someone who does 3D graphics. That stuff hasn't changed that much between the years. The one thing they had to do special is they had to use older compression met methods that were less efficient than what we have today, and also, um, of course, rendering took longer. And they had, when they saved, they had to run a program over the graphics that dithered the graphics. So reduced the number of colors and, you know, used checkerboard patterns alternating between uh, two colors to approximate a shade in between. Um, just draw the graphics on your tablet. It'll be fine. Yeah, with with drawings, it actually would work. I actually looked into this a little, but the main problem is a uh, video. Um, because video, um, I do not have a program right now that could generate video that this Mac OS 9 emulator could play. So uh, that would have been a whole extra day or whatever that I didn't have of research to actually make it work. Um, so yeah, but uh, so I'll be stealing the graphics from here. Um, maybe we should have a quick peek at that. That looks nicer. So uh, your Swiss Army knife for anything programming related on a Mac was usually res edit. That was a program that came from Apple and uh, you could get it for free basically on every BBS or so. Um, so today that would have would be, you know, download it um, off of the internet somewhere of Apple's website um, would probably be the equivalent. Um, and so let's see, we want, I guess, MY is Mist Island. SE is Selenitic Age. You see a mist, Selenitic. ME is Mechanical Age. CH is Channel Wood. And all res is apparently a file that they use to keep graphics they needed for, um, you know, that all of the ages needed. So let's go into Mist Island. We can just grab this file, drag it onto Res Edit, like you would be able to do on macOS today. And it will open it. And you will see it just contains picked resources, which is the standard vector drawing format, basically. And there you have the graphics. So um, you see these are just normal, nice color graphics. Um, not very large and quite dithered. Um, so yeah, um, that's how they keep their graphics. There are also, you see that in this all res file, they have other things, they have sound resources. 
Um, so for example, a closing door, a squeaking door, a sliding, whoops. That was the wrong menu item. It tried to play a scale with that. I meant this one. Okay. Um, let's see, do we have gas? Electrical servo motor. So you see, they have lots of sounds in here. Apparently they kept all the sounds in this shared file. So yeah, lots of useful sounds. And here X command and X function are like native code extensions that they use to do, to change, uh, uh, to, to do things that HyperCard itself wouldn't let you do. Hi, Tony, how's it going? Um, so yeah, this was basically a short summary for everyone who's, who's seen this stuff in one of my previous streams streams see there are some really cool things on the screen <laughs> really old things yeah okay so we have hypercard here so why not start hypercard and create our own game so we create hypercard we do create a new stack now mist itself is split up into lots of stack like one per age we're not you know going to reproduce any of that we're just going to make one simple stack in which we dump all this stuff that's fine so um we have our hard disk here so let's say let's call this mysterious um and we should probably check how large, oh, we can't. Oh, well, we can create it at the standard size. I think mist was slightly larger. So this small size 512 by 342 is the size of the Macintosh classic. So the original model of Macintosh, also the, you know, Macintosh 128 and 512. Um, Mist is slightly later, so will probably be a little larger. Um, so let's just go back into res edit. And I think we can do resource. Uh, no, here, and then, yeah, this is a full picture. Uh, open using template, picked. Uh, so templates are basically descriptions of data structures that are stored in resources. Um, some of them are very limited, but they show some basic functionality if there is one included with ResEdit. It doesn't have one for all resources because for some uh, the templates are too primitive. Um, so, okay, it's too big. That's unfortunate. Um, your network works again. Very well. Very good, Ada. Um, which version of HyperCard is this? You're blindly guessing 2.3 as it added QuickTime thingies. It's actually the latest. So 2.4.1, I think, is the version number. Um, so yeah. Um, it's So it's the newest version of HyperCard you could ever have got. Um... Yeah, I can't really. Yeah, no, this won't make sense, the hex editor either. So I don't know how large it is. We'll see. We can make it larger later. Um, 
But anyway, we've created a hypercard stack, mysterious. We'll quit this now because on classic Mac OS only one file, uh, one application can have file open. Okay, yeah, we want to add a resource fork. And now let's see, um, we want to, let's see, which do we have? Maybe the inside of, yeah, here, this looks like the inside of the clock tower. So let's pick this one, paste it here so we have a picture. Um, this is the reverse side, grab that as well. So now I have, oh, and the copy paste actually worked. That's good to know. So I guess res ah yeah I think res edit <laughs> res edit doesn't use the standard QuickTime API so the broken emulator doesn't break res edit oh thank goodness that would otherwise have been a really big problem for us yeah res edit template editor can't open resources with text fields larger than thirty two thousand characters yeah it's because text fields use the text edit library, which had a 16 bit limit. Exactly, Tony. Um, technically, you can have one file open for writing, but can have multi -fi multiple files open for reading. But yeah, res edit and hypercard probably both want write access. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, okay, so I think. We've got everything we'd need for our demo. Yeah. Okay, so let's close that then. So we've stolen a few files. Let's save and quit. And uh, let's start Hypercard again and check. Yeah, we don't have color tools yet. And it's not, oh yeah, here. Um, so here's the thing, Hypercard is black and white, but this color tools stack that you see here next to Hypercard um, is a native code plugin that you can install into a hypercard stack to add color to it. Um, and let's do that. So first, all right, we've installed it. Um, and go back home. Huh. Ah, yeah, here. We have the color tools are on button on the front page of our home stack now. So we can actually turn them off. And if I turn them on, you will see that this color menu suddenly popped up. Um, and we can now use that in our stack. So we've opened our stack and now we say open coloring tools. Opening the color editor will install scripts and resources in your stack to allow it to display color objects. Okay. And now you see we get this palette, which lets you do some color things. So for example, we can say we want a picture. Um, and we have a completely different menu bar now and we can say place a picture. And you see it will actually see the pictures that we copied into our stack um, with res edit. And so we can use those or we could use import 
to get a picture from elsewhere. I think usually it wants picture files there though, which I don't think I have any. Oh wait, I could make a screenshot. Okay. Why do, oh, is it, uh, -oh, uh, -oh. uh, we'll see, import, um, data, where did it save, picture one here, that's where it created, so we can say import a picture file, and now we have the screenshot we just took as another picture file. I mean, single file open and single app. Oh, thank you for the follow, Xenobite Offsec. Didn't see you there. Um, this HyperCard caller tool is really interesting. Never seen it live before. Yeah, it's, you know, you can see that it's bolted on, but it's, it's, it works surprisingly well. So anyway, um, so we can place this picture, for instance. And now it'll just be like a vector object or something. And now you see it's a slightly different size. So uh, what we can do now is first we can close the color tools again. Um, and now we can do um, objects stack info and resize the stack a little bit. So we know it will need to be wider. Oh, and I guess we're low on RAM now. Uh, let me just quit HyperCard and give it some more RAM. That's a classic Mac OS 9 problem. Get info memory. Oh, it actually that's interesting. Let's give it 16,000. And make sure, let's see, the minimum is 2,000 at least. Okay. And you saw, like, the stack came up white, and then the code ran and uh, showed the graphic. Um, and now we show the scroll window. So HyperCard didn't have scroll bars in its main window. But if you were, for example, running a stack on a computer that had too small a screen, it would show you this little palette, kind of like in Photoshop, where you can show a subsection of the card. And I'm now going to be very, very clever um, because you see that gray outline here. So I can now figure out exactly the size, the width that it has to be. And now if I go into Stack Info and click Resize, there are several options here. You can say Small, Classic, PowerBook, Large, Mac Paint, and you can say Screen, and you can say Window. And Window is the current size of the card window, even if the card is larger. So I can just go Window, and now I know, okay, the width they picked was 544. And the height... Uh, yeah, it's a little more. I guess it's about one pixel higher. Okay, let's make it. Oh yeah, of course. Um, of course, it's larger because they left room at the bottom for the pages you are carrying. So let's make this, say, this large. 
Um, and take our paint tools. Um, we can say options, draw filled. Now this is all gray. Then we can make sure that black is selected from our patterns. We can just tear that off. And we can go into the background and draw a black border at the bottom so it looks a little nicer. Hi, Magician Sir Jonic. Does the size need to be a multiple of 8? Looks like HyperCard keeps the window position aligned every 8 pixels too, probably to optimize display. Um, I think it's actually... I think vertical is pretty much free but horizontal is aligned to 16 pixels not just 8 16 yeah you spotted that well um that was a optimization for the black and white drawing it's hypercard is blazingly fast for its black and white graphics which makes it even sadder that the color graphics that we have here are actually comparatively slow. Um, all right, so uh, now go back from the background. So I didn't explain. The background is a feature of HyperCard. It's basically a master slide that it has. Um, so um, you can put stuff on the background that will show up on every card. So every page, every room and uh, stuff you put on the foreground will show up differently. But um, color tools does not really know about foreground and background. And so if I switch to the background, no, now. So I say edit background. You see the color graphics are still there. If I now say redraw screen, now it goes away. So you have to tell color tools explicitly to redraw. If I go back to the foreground and then say redraw screen, my colors come back because I placed those on the first card. Um, and uh, just... Um, let's see, one W and E. Okay, so let's name that the same as they named the image. Um, so card info, clock one W. And now let's create a new card, a second card. And you see it only has the black bar that we drew in the background. And now we can get our coloring tools again and place another picture. You can double click the picture tool to place a picture. Most likely the original Mac had one bit graphics where one byte contains eight pixels. Um, yeah, but aligning on 16 is I think related to the 68,000 Mac because it doesn't like uh, alignment on non-even addresses. So that was basically an optimization for the black and white graphics to be on, you know, either 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 byte alignment, which made everything a lot faster. And everything that they operate on is a multiple of 16. So that's basically why this multiple of 16 is. And uh, by the way, hello, magician. Um, I haven't seen you here before. Nice to have you. Oh, and Subdigital, hi. Hey there, Uli. The nostalgia is strong on this stream, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, the 16 bits is the memory 68K alignment limitation. It can't access odd addresses, see? Yeah, I learned that the hard way because I wrote some code on a 6820 Mac, which had no problem with odd addresses. 
And then people went and told me, hey, um, this is crashing on my classic. And I was like, okay, why? Until I learned about the fact that uh, I'm probably using the wrong alignment. Okay, so let's place this graphic. All right. So now we have two pages. So we can go back and forth. You see, it looks pretty decent. Um, so that's basically how the Mist folks started. They rendered these graphics painstakingly in, uh, in I think it was Stratavision at the time. I don't remember what app they actually used. And so now we want to be able to turn right or left, right? So what we'll do is we'll create a new button and you see how the color works because this button that we created here, you see all its white transparent areas, if you see it at all, it's a bit hard to make out. Um, so um, all its white transparent areas get replaced with color and all its black pixels stay black. Um, so now, uh, just for you to see how the color tools really work, if you open the coloring tools, um, you can actually select a button and give it a color. Um, or you can, let's see, make it something more obvious. Um, and you can double click it or choose actually, um, you can choose get info here even. And what you can see here is you can set the color in numbers, you can change its location and you can change its bevel. So now you see you get a really odd 3D effect. So now uh, let's just use this and move this button right at the edge. Come on, Ugh, pixel precise positioning is a little awkward here. Um, and make sure that we resize it to something where the lever is still clickable because we need a separate button for that. So now let's name this. Oh, right. We can't get info on this button right now. Can I copy and paste? Nope. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, so we could do a colored button like that but actually we don't want the color. So we'll just delete this again. And you see, like I just, you, you probably didn't see it. You might have heard it. I hit the delete key to delete the colors, but the button is still here. So this color thing is really an overlay mode, um, completely separate. Okay, so we have this button. Now let's, um, see if we can copy and paste or if the emulator yeah okay that works thank goodness for applications and i never thought i'd say that that do not use the standard clipboard api <laughs> all right so we have a second button let's name this button turn right um and this button turn left and then we need one more button. Um, come on. Oh, only the corners work. For left lever. 
and another button right lever and the last button reset lever we don't need to name them but it's just clear what's happening now so now we have buttons here in all the places they look a bit out of place Um, that alignment thing made me want to check some things and it seems that some instructions can do unaligned memory access even on the 68000. Most notably pack bits uses move B instruction to read memory while incrementing address one byte at a time. Might be that move B supports unaligned but move W, L don't. I don't know, at least for sure, that SP and PC need to be 16 bit, bit aligned all time. Yeah, it's there are ways to get at unaligned bytes, but they were slower at the time. And so, especially here with graphics output, you of course wanted to be as fast as possible. And so that was an easy way, you know, whoops. That was surprising. Okay, let's make these buttons a bit shorter. Um, anyway, so uh, we have the buttons here. Um, now here's one thing. Um, this is all like the color tools actually use a bunch of native code plugins. And one of them is called um, add color and if we go into stack info and the script we will actually see that it wrote a script for us um, so it just said send color me to this card pass open card so um, on open card and open card that is a command handler so basically like a function in C. Um, so for example, it says color me and actually here it defines on color me add color color card stamp zero and color me. So this is just calling this handler, but this is in the script of the stack and hypercard has a hierarchy. So a document is called a stack and it consists of multiple cards. And so when you, for example, click on a button, then a mouse up command is triggered. And that is first sent to the button so the button can react to it. Uh, we can probably demo this. So let's take this turn left button script you see it already created a example on mouse up handler for us. So we can now say play boing C E G for example. And now when I click this, it played C E G in uh, with the instrument boing. You can also say play flute C E G. Yeah, my understanding is that for reading 8 bits, the CPU needs to fetch 16 bits of data from memory. Yeah, something like that. It's a low level detail that at the time I didn't really get into why it was necessary. There were so many mysteries in computers at the time when I was learning programming. Were those sounds you are playing also resources, by the way? Yes, they are resources inside HyperCard. Uh, I can show you them in a moment. Um, anyway, so we click this button. Um, and now what we can also do is we can go, go into the script of the card and say on mouse up and mouse up play boing 
A5, for instance. And now, when I click this button... When I click anywhere else... It does the Boeing A5. Um, so now you may have noticed, I clicked this button and it didn't do, uh, it didn't, you know, you, when, when I edited this button, you saw a on mouse up and mouse up. Now the thing is, if I say, um, answer, quote, um, and the script of card button left lever and quote. It actually shows you two quotes. It's empty. Now, if I edit script, it will actually notice, oh, this is a button and it has no script and will, as an example, add the on mouse up and mouse up. If I now close, let's see what it did. It's still empty, so it noticed you didn't change anything. But if I now go in and like type a space in here, it will actually ask me save changes, yes. And now it doesn't play a sound anymore. It plays one outside the button, and it plays the other button. And if we now look at the script, it actually says on mouse up and mouse up. So this is a little misleading, but um, uh, what this means is as long as a button script is empty, it's mess it doesn't intercept any messages, or as long as it doesn't have a handler for for example, the mouse up message. And then it gets forwarded to the card. And if the card doesn't handle it, we can actually handle it in the stack. And this hierarchy exists in HyperCard. There is also the background I mentioned, so where I draw, drew this bottom black bar. Um, and that is... Um, uh, and the background also takes part in this. So a message goes from the button that was actually clicked to the card that contains this button to um, the background um, that this card belongs to and then to the stack that contains these cards and backgrounds. Um, so all very simple, actually. Um, and I just realized, let's copy the card's name, go to the next card, and give that card a name too. That was clock 1E, I think, was what the graphic was called. And now, what we want to do is, when you say turn left, we actually... Oh, one more thing. Um, and the pass thing you saw earlier, if we say pass mouse up here, that means that it will do this code and then do forward the message, let it go on. See, we get both. Here we only get the, the A5 and uh, here we can say play harpsichord is the third standard sound, so play harpsichord, C, E, G. And so the difference between these scripts is that the turn left script plays the song, sound and then passes, which causes the card to play its sound. Um, the left lever just plays the sound and of course clicking on the card, there is no button to handle it, so it goes directly to the card. Um, so that's basically how scripts in HyperCard work. Um, and then there is this useful feature. So if we uh, do 
button info on this button, there is this link to function. If I click this, I get this nice link to palette window. And now I can go to the next card and say link to this card. Now it gets, goes back to where the button was. And if I now click here, Oh, right, it doesn't work because I'm using pass. Um, so you see it just appended go to card and here it uses the ID number. Like every button or every object in general has an ID number, which is just a unique kind of random number for the object. Like for buttons, it's only unique on the card for... Um, for... Uh, cards, it's unique in their stack and things like that. Can you Macintosh say, oh yeah, I could do that. So for example, first let's move this. Uh, let's leave this and move this code into the right button. So what we can say is, I think it's speak or is it say? I am um, the button. Let's see if that was the right name. I am the button. Yeah. You hear I am the button. And now we can say card info speak I am the card. I am the button. I am the card. And here we can say speak I am the lever button I am the lever button I am the card I am the button I am the card all right um so yeah just as an illustration um and now um, so if you look into the stack script, um, that gets, so open card is the message that is sent when you go, when you arrive at a card. Um, and when you leave it, you get close card. Um, and what this, what these do is they send color me to this card. So that means they send a message to the card here. And I think, uh, no, but so what you could do is on this card, you could have a color me handler of your own um, that does something special and then say pass color me to actually do this. And this add color is the native code module that actually does all the color stuff. And you just tell it, the first parameter kind of tells it what to do because it has multiple functions. So, um, so add color, for instance, once when you open the stack, it does add color install, which sets up all its data structures and inter installs a callback that intercepts whenever HyperCard draws its black and white stuff into the card window. And at this point, it just merges its color into that. Um, and so when you close the stack, of course it has to clean up again. So it does add color remove. Give me one second. Oops, I hope this won't get me muted. Um, that was an alarm clock that I hadn't turned off. <laughs> um, all right, uh, where were we? Yes, so, and it passes open stack and close stack just in case anyone else wants to handle it. It only needs to do its setup. It doesn't want to prevent others from doing similar things. Um, so install does setup, remove does tear down, and color card actually um, does the drawing. Stamp is a visual effect to use. Um, 
and zero is the duration, I think in sixtieths of a second. Um, so for example, I think I could do iris open, uh, say 20. And now you see, whenever I go to a different card, it does this iris open effect. Um, and that's actually, I think, why this color me handler exists. Um, because I can say open coloring tools. And now I can say effects and I can set a transition for the current card for the current background or for the current stack so what I just did is I changed stamp here um, to I think iris open I guess I used a number it doesn't know um, uh, but so we can do a card transition and say, for instance, dissolve, uh, dissolve is kind of pixelated. I think there was, wasn't there a crossfade checkerboard? No, I guess not. So dissolve, I guess is the best one. Okay. And now when I close the coloring tools. Okay. Ah, it's only when I enter this card that it uses that card's effect. Um, and now I think what it did, yes, it added a color me handler to this card. And you see it does add color, color card, dissolve, 30 ticks. So about half a second for the effect. Um, and so the plugin that the original Mist developers used actually didn't have this nice user interface. So they had to write basically what is in the color me handler themselves. Uh, moreover, they had to write a little more themselves which we'll see in a second a little bit. Um, so let's quit HyperCard for now and let's look what has happened with our stack and its resources. So you see it has the pictures we copied with ResEdit. It actually also has the screenshot that it says it's too large. Let's just quickly Whoops. Oh, that's nice. I was looking for that earlier. Now I know what button to press for that. Um, okay, let's find res edit. I think it's here, yes. Um, get info, memory. Oh yeah, it's 600K. So let's say 10 megabyte and maybe one megabyte minimum. All right, uh, and now edit our file again. And now, um, yeah, it actually shows us the screenshot. Isn't that nice? I'm not quite sure what the 25001 is supposed to be, but it can't display that one. Anyway, so our pictures are still there. Our imported picture has been added with a unique number. Um, and then we have these bits and uppercase bits resources. So now you need to know a convention. Um, the original Macintosh, which was mostly 68,000 code, uh, 
used uppercase resource names uh, like picked, like str hash for string lists, like xcmd for native code command plugins in HyperCard. And um, so basically they added a resource here that they can just load with your stack and that contains the code that is used um, for merging the black and white and color graphics here. Hyper, hyper, what, what is going on? Am I, am I saying super card instead of hyper card or what? <laughs> or were you just getting your internal scooter on? <laughs> um, hyper, hyper, do, 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 do. <laughs> Sorry, wrong window. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, but the official convention from Apple later was that um, lowercase letters in resource types are reserved. So these are these little four character codes that you see here are basically like file extensions. So every file can contain files and they're grouped by their type. And so Apple reserved, um, it was, you were debugging HyperCart with Xcode and the damn thing crashed while you were typing and this window was below it. Aww. Um, yeah, so um, Apple reserved all the lowercase resource types for its own use. Um, and so when PowerPC arrived, all the new resources that Apple defined got lowercase names. And that's why we have XCMD for a 68K external command and lowercase XCMD for a power PC external command. And if you're looking here, you're actually seeing add color. So that is the native code that merges our colors here. And here is another add color, and that's the 68,000 code. Um, but sadly, I didn't, I don't have the editor installed on this computer. Um, that would disassemble the 68,000 code so you could actually read it. Um, but here you see joy, P-E-F-F, -F, that's preferred executable format, and then PWPC, PowerPC. So that's part of the start of any PowerPC code fragment. Um, when it's saved into a resource or into an application. So yeah, so, um, and the bits are the same. It's just that one function that needs to be installed into the operating system as an override that they did as a separate resource. And as far as I know, this check timestamp resource is so you can tell if HyperCard has been quit and restarted without doing an, an add in color, without doing an add color remove. Um, because uh, that's uh, what they do, um, what, what they use this resource for, so, so that they can tell, okay, it hasn't been properly uninstalled. Um, I need to install it basically it's they're using a hackish way of uh, uh, patching into the system um, necessarily but anyway one more thing that you're seeing here is an HCCD and HC of course usually stands for hypercard and CD is a common abbreviation in hypercard for card like in your source code, you can say, go to next card, 
or you can say go next CD for instance or go next card. You can even say go next, but they had some shorter forms and card could be written as CD, background could be written as BG or BKGND and things like that. Um, and so this HCCD resource, um, you uh, you can actually not see that, but this ID number is the same number as the ID number of our card. And so this shows, you can read clock 1W and clock 1E. So this is a resource that describes all the colors that we've set for buttons and all the picture names to load uh, f for our color information. So everything we did with the graphical editor gets saved into these resources here. Um, and uh, Hypertint, which I think was what they used for Mist, did not use these resources. Like it had actual code commands to do that. But the thing is, uh, mist uh, 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 at color can do that too. Um, and so you can do pretty much all of the things that you're doing here in code as well. Um, so for example, we want um, Uh, let's first delete this dissolve effect and then in the stack info change that back to stamp zero. So now we want it to have an effect um, when we move between cards. So what we can do, um, so there's a special command in HyperCard called lock screen. And what it does is it tells HyperCard not to update its drawings. So for example, if you were writing code that um, goes to another card grabs a bit of information there and then returns to the current card and pastes the information there. You usually don't want to have that flash where the other card comes up quickly and then disappears again. That's where you would use lock screen. You would say lock screen, go to the card, get the info, go back, unlock screen. And then the user doesn't even see that you changed cards. Um, and colorizing, uh, uh, add color uses this to its advantage because that means if you lock the screen before you go to another card, add color is the only one who will do any drawing. So you can say lock screen, go to card 4023, add color, color card dissolve 30. And so if I'm not completely wrong, yeah, you saw we got the transition effect. Uh, of course, what we actually want is maybe a different effect. So let's look at, I guess card transitions are okay. Um, from left, I guess, or from right. I think that's the only ones we have here. Okay. So if we want it to look like we were turning, then we probably want from left here. And you see now it kind of looks more 
like when we turn. Um, I think you're a bit delayed. Um, I just explained the lock screen. If you didn't catch that or anything, let me know and I can tell you again. Anyway, so that's basically how you would do the navigation. So uh, let's make this button not show its name, not highlight, and make it transparent so it's invisible. And uh, wait, let's do the same for this one. And do from right here. And so now we can decide whether we want to turn left or whether we want to turn right to get to the other side to, to like turn 180 degrees. Uh, okay. So now we've done the first bit of what you would do to create your own mist with HyperCard. We've put the color graphics on the card and we have hotspots that let us, you know, turn around or something. Um, and we just have two cards. I can use the arrow keys to switch between those, but I can also use effects. Um, so now it gets more difficult because um, let's see where the movie files are here. And now clock one. Let's see gear. So what we have to do here, of course, is open these in res edit and get info for each one because mist changed the creator and type code um so type should be movie which is what quicktime used and tvod i don't remember I don't know what that actually stands for, but it's what QuickTime uses. So basically I'm changing the file extension from .mist to .mov or to .mp4. Um, that's the equivalent on like a modern Unix or Windows system to what I'm doing right now. Okay. Let's do these for all of these. And then we can play them and see which one I actually want for our demo. Let's see. Tvod. Movie Tvod. All right, let's see. Later. Okay. Okay, that's just the chain. What is gear gate? Ah, oh, that's when you're once you're done. Gear three, two, one. Okay, those are actually not the ones. I want what's this one? Whoops. Didn't really want that one. May 
maybe it's this one. Nope. That's the door in front of the place. Back in our page. Huh. That's a bit annoying. Oh, maybe... Hmm. Planetarium, stairs, wind, I think those are sounds. Vault, mountain, vault, atrus, vault, water. Birds. Alt sound into garden. Hmm. I guess we can check out all the others. Maybe they made it using pictures. I think that's the ones we looked at. Would be a bit annoying if I couldn't find if I couldn't find the right uh, the right levers. Hmm. That's the clock on the outside in every rotation. versions of this clock. and solutions. Ah, there's a few more things. Well, anyway, um, let's not faff about this much longer. And instead, look at the movie. So let's see, gear three. Yeah. And gear one, yeah. So let's just use those, I guess. So copy those over. 
to our fake and go back here. And so now, how do we do movies? And you might have noticed there is a button tool and a field tool and some black and white pink tools, but there's no movie tool. And uh, the trick for doing movies is again a native code plugin, which also came with HyperCard. Um, so um, I think it's here. No. Oh, right. It was in uh, here, I think. Where was it? New features. I think. Whoops. Uh, um, nope. QuickTime movie integration. That looks good. Um, the QuickTime Tools stack. Oh, do I even have that? Where did that go? Ah, QuickTime Tools here. So there is a command, which is the movie external. Um, and so, uh, let's see. Oh, wait, I think they actually have it built in. Um, because I think the tasks, yeah. So tasks is a button that lets you basically write some common scripts. And so there is a movie task. So I can just go here and say on our hard disk, gear one, open. Not draggable window, floating window sounds good. No movie controller, not close after playing. Top left corner at somewhere here. Let's try this about here. All right, and now let's see what happens. I am the lever button. Okay, so it created a little window. Um, and maybe remove this. Um, and so basically the important code is here. Movie, file name, plane. I think I can say, no, wait, borderless for that. Let's see if that works. And uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so this external is not quite perfect, but what you can see is that I now have my movie playing on top of the hypercard window. Of course, if I move the window, this movie doesn't come along. Um, so I would have to write some extra code to make it do that. And that's basically how they did all the animated bits. They just used this movie command to actually play stuff. They used a modified version. Um, you, you have lots of parameters. So maybe I should go over the script just so you're a little more familiar. So they've done this whole play movie 
with the actual name here um, so they define their own utility command um, to actually apply all the settings that you want that way you know if you're changing something of the settings they know exactly they can replace this function with their code you know solving the problem of what if the user edits this uh, do we have to parse it or something um, it makes it easier to parse if you know you wrote the script and how you wrote it um, so what they first do is they check is there already a movie window open and if yes they don't create a second one um, and then they actually call the movie external give it the file name to run uh, the style so in this case I, I want a borderless because of course I don't want any window borders around um, you know around this animation um, close window one no Ah, never mind. You know what I mean. Um, it's a bit hard to close this window now because it doesn't have a close box. Um, and then below that they have... So if there's an error, then it won't create a window, of course. And then they this window becomes a object. Even though it's created by native code, it becomes an object that you can manipulate using HyperCard. So HyperCard actually um, remembered um, which external command went with which window. And if you clicked on a window, it would forward those messages to the external command. They called these X windows. So like XCMD. Well, X windoids, really. So windoid is because they're most of them originally were floating palette windows, like the tool palette. And those are called windoids by HyperCard. Well, by, it's like an internal name, like the, uh, yeah, um, it's an internal name they used. Um, and so then they say, set the controller visible to false so that we don't get a play button send pre-roll to the window so you could even send messages to native code created windows they they just arrived there as a string and then the external command had to do whatever it wanted and so in this case pre-roll just means load the movie even though we haven't asked to start playing it yet so that it is ready to play you know, loaded from disk a little bit already. And then they show the window. And then they send play to it, which actually makes it start playing. Um, so that's basically all this does. And if you look in this QuickTime Tools documentation, um, you can actually find there is a lot of stuff that you can do there. For example, you can set the playback position in code and so that's what they did like every time you know they knew that it's like i don't know um it's basically one second from one number to the next you have three different numbers they have three to one they have one to two two to three um so that means um if you pull the lever once, it will move, for example, from three to one. Um, then if you pull it again, it will move from one to two. Uh, then it will move from two to three. And as it hits three, it will automatically, invisibly, rewind back to the start. And now you can continue turning as if it was rotating. So it's the same approach that you would use for a carousel in HTML. And so 
that's basically what they do there. Um, oops, I'm on the button tool. Let's go topics, hotspots, index by term, externals, movie info, parameters, file name, window style, location, visible layering, commands, idle. So you even get uh, you can even simulate mouse clicks in the movie if you wanted. Like, um, QuickTime does a lot more than just movie playback. So they had, you know, 3D panoramics, and you could actually define hotspots in a QuickTime movie. So that's why they have uh, that you can uh, send certain messages to a movie. Um, so, for example, the pre-roll message is in there. Reverse, rewind, um, step forward, step reverse, uh, and here, properties. Um, so you can actually tell it to send a message to the current card when it hits a certain playback position. Um, and so I think there is end time. That's probably something like current time or so. And you can even say which cursor it should have when you're over this window. So um, start time, time scale, where's the current time? I don't know, it's somewhere in there. We could probably just search time. Callback time, cur time here. So that's the command you would use. You would just say set the cur time of this movie to uh yeah two thirty whatever that is. Um, I don't quite know what format. I think it uses the quick time. So like you have a time scale and the time value so it's not seconds or something like that and you have a time format and you can say system time or movie time so you can either say hours minutes seconds ticks or the string constant movie time an integer in the movie time scale yeah so that's basically it. Default quick time scale is 600 units per second, but it can be customized by movie. Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. You can basically every movie can specify its own. Um, but anyway, that's basically what they did. They just went, okay, we know, for example, if the time scale was, uh, I don't know, for 60 frames per second or something, then you could probably just give it the frame number or something, you know. But anyway, so that's how it basically works. Um, and that's, if you look at that, that's not really a hypercard stack. Like all these buttons in the end are invisible. Um, the graphics come from the native code plugin for color. The animations come from the native code plugin for movies. Um, the only thing that might be native is the sounds with the play command that I used earlier to demonstrate some of these uh, uh, click behaviors. I am the card. 
um oh yeah i changed that to the but you know these ones play boing c e g you could use those i think um uh, where was it how are you that's what it's called so you can just play basically any kind of sound. How are you today? So that's a, an actual audio recording. Um, and by the way, this audio recording window that you find here is actually another native code plugin that is part of that, that ships with HyperCard and is part of the audio help stack. So that should give you an idea. Like a lot of the, like there, there's, there are a lot of features that were actually implemented with native native code plugins. Um, for example, um, let's go home. Can I close this window somehow? Well. Let's just say close window two, three, four, five. Let's see, clock. 1 w gear 1 dot move close window clock 1 gear w dot move ah Let's just quit hypercard. It's faster than figuring out how to type the name. Okay, um, there's uh, one more interesting hypercard stack, which is called where is it? Power Tools. And this stack actually shows a lot more native code plugins. For example, this palette window that it has is another native code plugin. Um, and it adds a lot of these little palettes and you can actually create your own using this power tools stack. So it has a bunch of example things and here it has this palette maker. Um, so you can pick two kinds of window title um, this looked more different um, originally. Like originally in the original HyperCard under System 7, the palette for the message box looked like this. So it was black and white with dots in its title bar instead of lines like HyperCard had it. And then there was the second one, which was, this is actually too small. Wait, we had one earlier. This one, this was the style. If you wanted a window title, then it was this large. If you of course now look like all the palettes have this system native palette window style because macOS 9 actually added its own system native palette window frame. Um, and, and this one actually shows the window title in a smaller font if you have one. So if we go back to the palette maker um, and create this palette, or I think it's already created, so you can just show it. This stack, user level, display. So now you see like it just has the window title in there. It's not larger. Um, but anyway, um, and here I can actually reduce 
the number of menus, but that's just a built-in feature that is exposed using this palette now. It's a convenience. But the thing is, what you can do here is you can do drawings. So if you look here, this is actually all just drawings. Um, and you can put transparent buttons on top of it. And the transparent buttons can have exactly one line of script. Um, but of course, you know, you could just send a message to the current card or something um, and have that message then do multiple lines of script. Um, so this, and, and then they used native code plugins to actually create a picked resource containing all your drawings here and um, take the dimensions of each button and uh, use those to um, uh, use those to decide the hotspot areas on this palette. Um, and so, uh, for example, what this does is, um, if you have a drawing tool, you know, you can tear off like the patterns and the tools. And uh, if you do line size, usually you get a modal dialog. In this stack, it actually intercepts that message and shows you this little palette that was created like this one. And then you can change the line size here. Um, so a lot in HyperCard that you might have used or might not have used um, actually came from native code plugins. But then um, if you go home and do the same thing, um, oh no, actually, <laughs> that's another trick. Okay, and now if I choose line size, I actually get the regular modal dialog that just goes away again. And uh, while I have that open, uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh. it gives me an error sound if I uh -oh. try to use any other application. It's, applic it's system modal. So that's the real built-in hypercard picker. You never knew about the line size palette. <laughs> Appearance Manager in macOS 8 added a lot more of those native UI widgets compared to what was in System 7 and earlier. Yeah, yeah. It's like these window borders, like the floating palettes, those were all um, uh, macOS, uh, so System 9 specific. Although I think... I think they fudged something because if you look at this palette window, um, ah, no, that's the one with the text in it. That's why it's one pixel taller. Okay, that makes sense. So it is taller, but one pixel or two, maybe one at the top and one at the bottom, I think. <laughs> Well, anyway, so that's basically how, uh, 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 yeah, that's basically a little tour. But now the question is, of course, how would you have made a game in HyperCard um, the way it was originally intended to? So let's create another one and... Let's call it monkeying around. Uh, and oh yeah, this stop using thing that I wrote, I should probably mention what that does. So in HyperCard, there is this command called start using. And what it lets you do is basically inherit handlers 
and resources from another stack. Um, so that means, for example, oh, I think I actually demoed that in a previous stream already, so I don't have to go into detail here. Um, but yeah, basically it just lets you, um, what Myst used it for is um, they have stacks that just contain images and don't actually contain cards. Um, and what that let them do was um, create um, like a script that replaced all the resources in a stack with ones exported from Photoshop or whatever they were using, the Strata Vision. Um, and then they could just in the main stack say start using this resource collection stack and they would have all the images available as if they were part of their main stack. Um, and so that, you know, made asset handling a little easier because assets were separate from like the button positions and, and the actual code. Okay, so let's make a little game. So how would you usually have done this? Well, one thing I haven't shown you yet is um, so you can create buttons using new button, or you can just use the button tool, hold down the command key and drag them out. Um, and that gives you a rectangular transparent button. So basically a hotspot, perfect for a game. So it's very quick to add something like that. Um, and a button can have an icon. There are lots of built-in icons um, that you can use. So I don't know, is there anything? For example, we can use Bill Atkinson's head. Um, and so you have now a button with an icon. And now we can say, okay, we want to draw. So I double click it to, to make it filled. Um, I hold down the Alt key, which means the line is also filled. Whoops. Oh, right, wrong key. Uh, Alt is this in the emulator, yes. Um, so now I have, I don't know, a bit of lawn. Again, this is all just black and white. Um, then I guess my sky is a little lighter. Um, and now I can put Bill at the right height. And now how would I make him do something? So one thing is I can say, edit the card script and say, on arrow key, there is there are a bunch of special messages. So there is arrow key, there is return key, enter key. Um, I don't think delete has its own message. Um, there is control key which is like some other key pressed together with control. So there are just message messages sent by hand. You wonder how many of those icons were drawn by Susan Kerr. I know that I think this Bill Atkinson was actually drawn by Susan Kerr. Um, and of course, there's a whole bunch of system icons in there um, that were also drawn by Susan Kerr, yeah, so a whole lot. And I think I did a count when I started doing my HyperCard clone, how many icons it had. And I think it's something like 276 icons. So a lot. Um, I forgot, I need a parameter here. And then, so on arrow key, if which key is left, then set the left of card button one to left, 
let's close this of card button one minus twenty. Okay, I think copy and paste works. Yes. Else if which key is right. So you can, um, there are different ways to change the position and size of a button. Like you can change its rectangle, which is four coordinates. So uh, left, top, right, bottom, um, comma separated. Or you can just use the left or the right or the top or the bottom. Um, you can also change the width or the height. Um, and there is the location, which is the middle, the center of the button. And if you change the width or the height, it's done relative to the location. Um, but if you change the left, or uh, then of course it will move the button without resizing it. Or rather, not of course, but it actually does that. Um, so now I can use the arrow keys to move Bill left or right. Um, and what else do we want to do? I guess we want Bill to shoot. So we can say on key down, which key and key down, if which key is space, then and if. Now let's create a bullet of some sort. Um, let's see, what do we have? That looks bullety enough. Um, oh, and we can name this button. We, we can actually name all buttons, then it becomes more readable than card button one. So then set the, wait, uh, maybe name this one, no, this one, Bill, put, the location of card button bill into pause. Um, let's see, item two. Oh no, actually, since they're the same size. Ah, no, let's do it this way just to illustrate it. So um, put um, the top of card button bill into item two of pause, set the location of card button bullet to pause, show card button bullet. That's a good start, I guess. So, whoops. What happened now? Oh, key down. Key down actually is called for all keys, even for the arrow keys. Uh, so I need to pass it for arrow key to ever be called. Okay, now that works again. And now if I hit space, he'll get a nice hat. 
And now I can say um, on idle um, if the visible of cart button um, what were you talking there by the paradigm paradigm should the variable name not be the key instead of which key so it forms an english sentence we could do that yeah true um, yeah, I'm not changing it right now. <laughs> if the visible of card button bullet is true, then and if and pass idle just in case anyone needs it, um, set the top of card button bullet to top of card button bullet plus 20. And now if the, oh no, minus 20 because coordinates come down from the top. Um, if the top of card button bullet, which is a number, um, is greater than, uh, is less than zero, then hide card button bullet. So, and as you see, now we can move and the bullet goes up and then disappears. So we can, for example, build asteroids now. And of course we can have something that we can shoot at. So let's see, uh, what else do we want? Maybe some of the standard system icons. What about a floppy disk? Or do you want to, let's do a CD-ROM in a caddy. Um, and now, else if, if, the location of card button bullet is within the rectangle of card button target. You can't see that, but luckily my head is not yet in the way. Then Hide, uh, play, boing, um, C, C, W, one. That should be a pretty low sound. That might sound like an explosion. Hide, card, button, target. Okay, let's see if this works. So here, shooting does nothing. That was an interesting sound, but it worked. Um, now, of course, we might also want to do something like... Um, Uh, maybe instead of hiding it, we should say set the location of card button target to 
on random width of this card, comma, random height of this card. Okay, maybe we should show, whoops, uh, that might be a problem. Um, if the selected chunk is empty, then pass arrow key. that okay that doesn't work let's do it this way <laughs> just circumvent the script okay oh no we can't hmm Well, I guess I can find out select a chunk into message box. It is empty. Hmm. I actually don't know. I guess I can just hard code it for now. I actually don't remember how I would detect. So the selected chunk usually tells you like, oh, character one to five of the message box or something like that. Okay. And so there should be a way to make it detect that we're actually typing code down here, but I don't remember how. Yeah. Of course, this code is not perfect because I'm doing nothing that keeps this thing from showing up here or here, um, but you know, we've written a simple game. See, <laughs> left as an exercise to the reader. But anyway, um, and so one more thing, let's use a different icon here. For example, this one, four, three, two, Oh, right, that's the one that has bad names, but 2156542157312573. So, Global G Juggler ID. If uh, if G juggler ID is empty, I've already forgotten the number. Then put two one three seven five into G juggler ID. You can pick arbitrary names for those, um, like. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, two one five seven three. Two one five seven three. I actually remembered surprisingly much from of this number. <laughs> Just swapped something. Uh, 
Um, and if is there a fixed delay between calls to idle, or is it dependent on frame rate? It's. I don't think there is a fixed delay. It's basically whenever the system doesn't have events to process, I think. So, you know, better code would be to, you know, measure the time, um, but I'm not doing this here. Um, but that was basically the only way to get processing time uh, without hogging the CPU. And, you know, like, you, you could run a loop in one of these handlers, but then that would, of course, mean um, that you uh, couldn't pull down a menu, for instance. There is no command that tells HyperCard, hey, process some events for 10 seconds or something. Okay, but looks good, though, that the speed is reasonable, even though this is high-end system, doesn't run too fast. Like the version one of Stunt Copter. Yeah, yeah. It, my favorite was um, uh, System 7 on a Performa 475. That's a 25 megahertz machine, I think. Um, if you scrolled like this, there was no delay between individual steps. So basically you push this and it zoomed down all the way. The only way to, to get to any point was by dragging it explicitly to that position. Um, so uh, yeah, not fun. Set icon of card button target to G juggler ID. Actually, we can put that here. And if it's not empty, then add one to juggler ID. Um, if juggler ID bigger two one five seven three four five six then and if also the start number so basically we're just looping the numbers of these four icons here and as you see it's pretty fast how fast idle runs here um But uh, yeah, we have this juggler. Yeah, they added the delay at the, some point to track control. Not sure if it was around 7.1 or 7.5.3 and almost depends on system. I know at least on system 7.5 running on a mini, mini VMAC with full speed, there is not de no delay in scrolling. So it behaves like you described and zooms right to the end of the scroll bar. Yeah, that, that was something that ha happened on actual hardware. So now we even have animated sprites, for lack of a better word. So that's basically how you were able to make games in HyperCard. And of course, it has, you know, like standard things. Like if you were making a point and click adventure, you could do something like have a look at button. Um, And then you could say um, on mouse up global current action, put look at into current action, or actually call that look at. Um, Let's make another one. All right, uh, auto highlight. Uh, and buttons have families. What is a family? 
it's basically a radio button group. So button family auto highlight. Uh, and now instead of look at, let's say walk to put walk to into current action. Um, Now we have the variable watcher here, which uh, shows you all the global variables. Um, you can actually see the juggler ID counting. And if I do look at, um, now you see current action is look at. If I do walk to, it changes current action to walk to. No magic. This game is shaping up really nice. Just scoring and some bits here and there, and you can publish this as a shareware game. <laughs> um, thank you for the follow, Zemzeramin. Some Zemzeramin. Okay, Zemzeramin. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, shooting out of Bill Atkinson's head is. Uh, always a uh, an amazing <laughs> thing to do but anyway so uh, what we can do now is we can create a text field um, and set its text style to centered and oh, let's use shadow and maybe Chicago. Okay. Let's see, where is the... Oh, I think, yeah, the line is just in the gray. Okay. Um, lock its text and name it verb line. And now we can do something like on mouse enter um, oh, actually oh, it doesn't matter. Let's write it in here. We only need one object as the demo. Um, put Global the short name of me. So you can, inside a button, you can use me to refer to the button. Um, and it has a name, which is card button ID 2 or something like that. Um, so I use the short name, which is just Bill. Um, into card field verb line. I should probably write that out. I just don't have autocomplete, so it's kind of tempting. And on mouse leave. Current action and three dots. So now it says walk to Bill. Oh, um, I need to do into card field verb line here as well, not dump it in the message box by accident. So now, oh, and I forgot the global. My initial thought was, oh, I'll just set it to empty. But of course, usually in a LucasArts game, you would say walk to dot dot dot, and then you can say walk to Bill. And now I could do a mouse up handler and say, you know, trigger the right walk to. And of course, look at, look at Bill. 
So uh, <laughs> that's the nice thing about HyperCard. It's just such a nice little toolkit. And I can put these text fields and these buttons on the background layer. And so for every room, I just create a new card, place a few buttons like this, uh, draw a few icons. You could even create your own icons. So like um, you can say edit here, then you get a copy of Bill and you can say, okay, whoops, um, maybe Bill should be wearing sunglasses. And now we have a sunglass bill. And of course, if I had a recorder here um, uh, or a microphone hooked up, I could even record my own sounds. I could just go here, audio, start recording, um, and then save that sound. And that adds a sound resource to this stack and then I could just play it. So I could do like or something and just have my explosion in there. So you can imagine like just the whole toolkit that is in there and how little you actually have to code or to know about coding um, is pretty good. I mean, it would be nicer if you didn't have to write the script, this idle script to run this animation. Um, if that was somehow built in, you know, if you could just say, I want to make an icon with 15 frames or something, and then it would just loop through it or something like that, you know? Um, but yeah, so this is how you would build a, uh, uh, a game normally in HyperCard. And so that's very different from how Mist did it, especially since, you know, I didn't really have to write any code to place anything. I just place it there. And when I want to ch something to change, then maybe I write, I write code and it'll just remember it. I can just quit here. And then I can start it again and it'll just continue how I left it. Which of course for commercial software distribution is a little annoying, but that's an idea that came from small talk. Um, yeah, I think that's basically what I wanted to show. I mean, you can, of course, I guess that's something you could do a game like mist here as well of course like um you can go and you know like draw a room and then put i don't know a painting on the wall you know, things like that. And then I could put a button somewhere. Cool to see all this. The ease of use looks similar to that of Visual Basic on PC, but this was on Mac in 1987. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, then I can just place the buttons here and I can use link to, to like connect it to a different card and then I click here and it goes to the other card. Oh, and visual effects are a little nicer. I guess let's just, oh, okay. The clipboard broke, broken is still there. So let's draw a different room. and use the fill tool and the patterns. I'm remembering all these shortcuts. Oh yeah, I can double click the fill bucket to get the patterns.
Oh, there was a hole. Maybe a little darker. There's even a little bit of a gradient here, so you can do a bit of a 3D effect or something. And so uh, now, if I want a visual effect, one way is to use the tasks, just say visual effect. And there are more effects here than in the color tools. So for example, there is scroll, but actually the one I want is almost scroll. Where is it? Uh, here. Push left, I think, would be the right one. Oh. Oh, I think the black and white effects are broken in the emulator. Dang it! That would have been such a nice demo. Well, um, it wrote the script for me. Push left. Let's see if slowly changes anything. Nope. That, by the way, Tony, I expect you to make visual effects in HyperCard work in your emulator. You know that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so Bill Atkinson is doing something clever here. Uh, the effect would have kind of like slid the one, the old card out and slid the new card in. So it kind of feels more like a, a turn, a rotation. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's how you would have built it, you know. You would have just drawn it directly, each room directly in here, placed buttons on clickable objects, maybe used icons. Some people even did things like, um, uh, you know, place multiple icons um, next to each other to kind of get a larger image. Hypercard 1x should kind of work, but 2x is totally bonkers. <laughs> yeah, it's they, they did a lot of crazy st stuff. Um, oh, one more thing. Um, nice trick, if you want to cover something with, say, an irregular shape. Um, like, say you want a bent corner on a page. Um, one thing that you can do is clip it a bit off but close all oh, right we have a selection tool with the command key here so the thing is hypercard generates its own mask for an icon so all closed areas become opaque but now if you look at this you see like these edges are opaque but up here it's transparent, even though you don't see that. So, uh, you know, here, because this is cut off. But I guess... Let's see, it might need to be like this to look halfway okay. Yeah. So now, uh, anyway, you, you get the idea. Like you can do opaque areas. Of course, if you just want to cover something, you could just use the opaque button style, which is just like opaque instead of transparent. That of course works as well. the earlier hyper hyper thing <laughs> yeah 
Oh, and we wanted to demo. Maybe let's do that in the mist stack because we have picts in there. And let's say card info. Here is the name. Make a new card. Make a new button. This is my favorite hypercard trick. Come on. Um, name clock one W and set icon of card button one two minus one. This is a bit hard to see, but it's actually drawing the picked resource on the button. Um, if my clipboard worked, I could actually use this a bit better. Oh wait, picture one might be more readable. Yes. So now you see it's drawing it's only drawing in black and white, of course, because this is a feature of HyperCard itself. But it's taking the picked resource and showing it. Um, and so that was a trick to draw larger icons. You could... Um, you could basically create a vector graphic picked resource with, uh, you know, transparency and opacity, or rather that drew in certain places and not in others. Um, and then by setting the icon ID to minus one and the name to the name of the picture you wanted, um, it would actually draw your picture instead. So HyperCard auto-generates the icon mask. Too bad you can't specify your own for, say, doing an outline on top of a black-gray background. Yeah, um, yeah, this would be one way to solve it, yeah. Oh, and I'm trying to remember. Can you actually set the cursor? I think cursor setting didn't really work. Set cursor to plus, I think, was a valid one on mouse leave. I think this thing is that it will reset the cursor on idle. Yeah. But I guess we could say, wait two seconds, then we would at least see the cursor if I spelled it right. Yeah. But it resets after those two seconds because the script gives up control. So that was always a bit of a problem. The, the There were a few ways to work around this with external commands, but... Uh, uh, otherwise, I think you had to do it with idle or something. Supercard, I think, lets you do that. I think it has a lock cursor or something like that. If it draws the picked always without putting it in an off-screen buffer before drawing, that's handy, as then you can use the transparency trick. Yeah, it does. Like, all the drawings in Hypercard are first done into an off-screen buffer. Um, as picked can contain also other than bitmap data, vector graphics, text, clipping regions, etc. Exactly, yeah. And I think it was Mac Paint 2? Mac, Mac Draw 2, sorry, Mac Draw 2. So like the Roman numeral. Um, so I think Mac Draw 2 
actually had a feature where you could take a pixel graphic and tell it to make it transparent where like white transparent um so that's what i use so i use like a very very light blue or something like that for all the white areas that i wanted to be opaque um and then you know in hypercard they would turn out white anyway but um it would be opacity um, I think it just uses the transparent pen mode. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I hope it was... It was either MacDraw 2 or Claris Draw. Or maybe it was both. And then, of course, export as picked resource and add it to your stack. But yeah, I think that's basically everything I can show. But uh, that's how you would make various kinds of games with HyperCard, including Mist-like games. Oh, and by the way, I'm surprised I turned on the user interface sounds. That macOS 9 had built in. And... Uh, And I'm surprised it didn't drive me mad. And I hope it didn't drive you mad either. Interestingly, macOS Toolbox contains a built-in function for converting bitmaps to the mask regions. Bitmap to region. Yeah. It was because if you look at icon resources... Uh, well, we have some now. So you have icon resources, like this one. You see it doesn't have a mask. It's literally a 32 by 32 bitmap. Like if you look at um, the size, it's 128 bytes, which is, uh, you know, there is, what is it? It's 32 rows by 4 bytes. Is that right? 32, 64, 128. Yeah. Um, so that's basically what they did. Now you recall why Astroneer sounds like macOS. <laughs> okay, do they have similar UI sounds? Very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. This has been a fun trip down memory lane and also learning new tricks. Should try making something new. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. Let me know if you make something. I would be interested. Um, I also have uh, on my YouTube, which is linked underneath this stream somewhere, or uh, I upload this, these movies to my YouTube as well. Um, these streams um, like they show up 24 hours after they're finished. Um, and there you will also find other videos. For example, one where I demo how to write a native code plugin. And actually, I'm demoing how to write a native code plugin like um, add color. It's a very simple version, of course, only. I think MacPaint Lasso Tool used bitmap to region need to check interesting okay yeah i never really i never really managed to figure out how the lasso tool works <laughs> i guess it just creates 
I guess it would like draw a polygon or something and fill it. And then create a region out of that shape and use that for clipping to cut what you selected out of the graphic and then um, have those on two separate layers. I actually wrote a bitmap graphics editor once and it's it's quite fun to, well, not once, several times actually. <laughs> um, but it's fun like how selections in bitmaps can work. Basically what you do is just you clip the part you want selected out, erase the area underneath it, and then have two bitmap, um, like two off-screen buffers, one for the selection, one for what's behind the selection. And that way you just move around what is selected and when someone removes the selection, at that point you draw the selection buffer back onto the background and it's merged. Which hypercard do you recommend to use today? That's a big question. Um, so the thing is, for one thing, I don't think there is something as good as hypercard today. Um, it depending on what you want, there are different things. There is a live code, which is a cross-platform thing that can run hypercard stacks, except for, of course, the native code plugins, which are specific to PowerPC Max and classic macOS, of course. Um, there, um, the live code is a commercial program. It used to be open source, but they've recently said that they're no longer interested in supporting the open source version. So there are some people who are keeping the source code around um, and trying to continue with the open source version. But, you know, the official support has disappeared. Um, and whatever they change in that application will not make it back into the open source version. Um, also, Supercard was... Uh, uh, not Supercard, uh, Lifecode was basically, getting ahead of myself there, Life Code was basically written by a Unix person and some of the extensions are, I, I would say they are very Unix-y. Um, so they don't really naturally make sense within the context of HyperCard. They are more, you know, what you would do in a modern programming environment. But how is that? How can I explain that? Well, HyperCard has, you know, this whole idea Oh, um, that you have a um, you, you know that it's natural kind of it uh, you just draw and it's there. You just place buttons and they're there. They have names that you would kind of expect. So like if you create a button, then you know you can refer to it by name. The styles are transparent, opaque, rectangle, round rect, shadow, checkbox, radio button, standard or default button. So default buttons is like an OK button. Um, so like, it's all kind of natural names, like what a p normal person would call different things, not what a programmer would call different things. And that goes like deep in, for example, um, that's probably the best example to kind of give you an idea. You have list fields. You can say I have a scrolling field. 
you can say it should automatically select. Um, and you can um, line one, line two, third line number four. And then you say lock the text. And then you can click something to select it. And now if you want to use the code for this, you can do something like on, I think it's on mouse up, um, put the selected line of me into message box. And now when I click this, you see line two to two of card field one. So that's because you can have multiple selections. So it says two to two and not just because it could be line two to three. Um, now, um, let's say we have two fields and we wanted to keep them in sync. Uh, no, wait, that was wrong. Let's say one. Okay. Now, a traditional programming language. Uh, so, so there is a command select and you use it and say select line two to three of card field two. And now if I click here, it selects line two to three. So now you see the selected line of me says line one to one of card field two or line two to three. Um, so the question is, um, how would you do this in card field two? Usually in another programming language, you would have to say something like select line word two of the selected line of me. And Word four. I think one, two, three, four, yes. Oh, um, maybe I should type it correctly. And you know, that works. But the thing is, hypercard is made for humans. So you can actually say selected line of me. I hope this demo works. There, there are spots that work like this, but it might be that I misremembered this one. Yeah, okay, this one didn't work. Um, so the thing is, you can remember. Yeah, it's because the selected line of me includes the field. That's why it doesn't work because now it says the selected line of me of card field two. Oh, maybe I, maybe it was just, but anyway, kind of things somehow like that. Yeah. Okay. This, this concrete case sadly doesn't work, but this is an illustration for the things that hypercard lets you do. It kind of is more forgiving if you're not quite precise, for example, um, you can say play Boeing C E G. So that's like separate parameters separated by spaces. You can also say play 
boing and quote CEG. And of course, you know, then it's a single parameter. Or you could have a variable containing CEG and then you can just say play boing my melody and it would still play CEG. So in, in many spots you have a value in a variable, for example like card button 15, and you can just say set the highlight of my variable to true, to like, you know, switch on a button or something. And, all, and little det details like that um, are basically missing in the new features in live code. And so things like that are why I don't think it's compatible. It will do all the things that HyperCard let you do. It will even import HyperCard stacks, but it, it kind of, it doesn't have the spirit. Um, there is SuperCard, sadly that's 32-bit only, and so far I haven't heard anything about it going to 64-bit, um, so I guess that's dead now. Um, there were a few others, but I don't think they exist anymore. Um, you used to know all these keywords, commands by heart, yeah, yeah. Me too. There's there's a lot of stuff where I go like, is it like this? Is it not? Is it something I wanted to do in my version? Um, but yeah. Um, but also there are other things. If you want to learn developing games or programs, um, for example, there is Hopscotch and there is Scratch. And they have kind of this thing where you kind of you you put together little blocks and like one C shape block is a loop and then you can put the other commands in there and they have commands like you know show a character at this position or move a character. Um, so like a lot of programming learn tools. Um, which I think are awesome and in some ways do what HyperCard used to do. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what you want to do. Like if you want to do something like an adventure game, uh, there is RenPy, which is a Python-based tool for creating visual novels. So they, they're very focused on this Japanese visual novel style. Um, but like, you know, you have background pictures, you have dialogue trees, you have characters, um, and you can like place characters in front of the backgrounds very easily. And then you can do more if you learn more of the Python side of things. Um, so there's, there's an awesome lot of things that I would say are successors to HyperCard in one way or the other. Um, I mean, you know, given HyperCard came with this addresses stack, you could say that, you know, in some way, address book is actually a successor to HyperCard if that was what you mainly used it for. Because like this addresses stack had the advantage that if you needed a field that this didn't have, you would just edit the stack and add another field. Oh, I think this is another of the cases where yeah, if I click too long, it jumps two cards. <laughs> I guess they wanted to let you scan through. Mouse still down, yeah. They, like, if you hold the mouse down for longer, it'll just do the same thing again, which in the emulator is too fast.
So yeah, if anyone has any questions or something, otherwise I guess we'll be wrapping it up. And I have basically not drunk anything since the stream started. Is this one-off stream about the hypercard development, or do you plan to do more? Um, this was mainly just a one-off about um, Mist and and like yeah and hypercard and how one would have done that or not, and and how it compares. Yeah, to put it in context, um, like a complete game developed with hypercard. Retroactive hydrate. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, I... I don't think I will make... Like, developing a game is hard enough with regular development tools. Doing it in an emulator with broken copy and paste in, you know, software from... Well, I guess this is from 92 or something, because it's HyperCard 2.0, 98. Um, but, um, so I think, you know, the, the chance of me finishing anything worthwhile in HyperCard is too small. Um, so, I thought about it, but it doesn't sound likely that I'll ever make it. Um, the bill shoot em up was almost done. <laughs> Don't say that. It, that's what, you know, people who get betas to try always say. Well, it's almost done. Why, well, you don't see all the shit that I've hard-coded and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think if if I make a game, I'll I'd rather make it in you know like regular Mac OS Swift or something like that. Um, but uh, at least not right now. But I mean, if you have other retro questions or something that make for a good stream. Um, especially if they're related to hypercard, then who knows? I I might do something like this again, but right now no concrete plans. Um, yeah. So. Ooh. Magician Sardonic, thank you for the follow. Um, yeah, I should probably do a little self-advertisement. So usually on this channel, I play games um, most of the time. Um, usually story-focused games or games that I just abuse so long that they, you know, that I can play them as if they were story-based games, like, you know, turn down the difficulty of the combat or whatever. Um, currently, we're playing Dishonored 1, um, which is a stealth game, steampunk, assassin thing. Um, so I'll be playing that again on Sunday. That's uh, 5 p.m. Central European time. We're actually no longer on summertime. Um, and uh, since the U.S. will switch daylight savings times next weekend, it will actually be at 8 a.m. again. So that bit of information here 
is still correct. Um, so yeah, I have other games that I'm planning to play. LucasArts Point and Click Adventures. Um, uh, other things like that. Quern, which is a mist-like game, is also on the list. Although we will still be spending quite a while more playing Dishonored because after Dishonored 1 there will be the Dishonored 1 DLC and then there will be the sequel to Dishonored 2 so um, a lot of games to play. I also rarely but occasionally play games um, play what are they called uh, 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 no, don't play. <laughs> I sometimes stream myself coding stuff. So in my spare time, I work on a hypercard clone myself. Um, because, as I mentioned, you know, I don't really think any of the existing hypercard-like programs um, get it right. And so I want to try doing it right um so occasionally i might stream me working on that um which means implementing my own programming language and things like that um so if you're interested in that stuff uh keep an eye out but don't get your hopes up too much um and that's basically it and now let's see if we can find someone to raid let's see anyone streaming right now that ah no I guess I guess I'll let you go home without a raid. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the chatting and the questions. And hopefully see you again for a future... Uh, a future... Um, with a programming or a retro stream or something or vaguely hypercard related. Bye-bye.